We are not professing to tell you the complete story of these activities. Yeah. We are professing to tell you the complete story that we know. Right. But these records that we've uncovered yeah. don't tell the story. They tell pieces of it. This is a story that has been told in bits and pieces. This is an attempt to pull most of it together. We know we don't have the full story. We do, however, have some striking new revelations and insights. The story begins here, just off the nation's front yard, the mall. The buildings behind me were the headquarters for the World War II Office of Strategic Services. It was here that the first halting steps toward mind control began. The shaper and molder of OSS was General Wild Bill Donovan. He said of his group's work, We may have made mistakes, but we were not afraid to try things that were never done before. In this anything-goes atmosphere, Donovan appointed this man, Stanley Lovell, a Boston industrialist, to break new ground in many scientific and technical fields. Donovan called Lovell his Dr. Moriarty, after the fiendish professor in Sherlock Holmes. Lovell liked the name and posed for this Saturday Evening Post photo. He later wrote of his OSS job that it was, quote, to stimulate the Pex bad boy beneath the surface of every American scientist and to say to him, throw all of your normal law-abiding concepts out of the window. Here's a chance to raise merry hell. It was in this atmosphere that the search for mind control began. This bizarre man would be an active participant in that search over the next two decades. His name is George White, an OSS captain who had formerly been with the Bureau of Narcotics. In his diary, seen here publicly for the first time, White left a legacy of the darker side of American intelligence work. He received his early OSS training at the British-run school at Oshawa, Canada, the same school where Ian Fleming, the creator of James Bond, was trained. White referred to the school in his diaries as the Oshawa School of Mayhem and Murder. Mike Burke, and former OSS colleague of White's and now president of Madison Square Garden Center. Very compelling fellow, uh, mysterious fellow, almost mystical fellow. He was fascinating because you didn't, you knew something about him, but not, all, not enough about him to really get a fix on him. Uh, he also knew a great deal about the swifter elements of society, the gamier side of life. And, uh, and he was very impressive in his technical knowledge of of the underworld, so to speak. He said, one of, one of our men gets beat up. He says, you have to act real fast and teach these guys a lesson. Charles Siragusa, a former narcotics officer and friend of White's. He said, I'll come around, he says, and break your kneecaps. And with that, one guy laughed. And George would always have a little, uh, little billy with him. And this one guy sort of snickered. George White turned around and whapped him across the neck with it. Then he picked up a pool stick and started beating everybody up. He made his point. And he made his point. George White was not a man of understatement or subtleties. His boss at OSS, Stanley Lovell, referred to him as deadly and dedicated. In this note from White's diaries, it says, Call Lovell regarding TD. TD was a rather transparent cover for truth drugs. George White worked with the Truth Drug Committee here at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in the nation's capital. They experimented with mescaline, scopolamine, and marijuana on unwitting victims. The committee soon learned there was no easy panacea, no truth drug at this stage. But White and later colleagues would not stop trying. The goal remained the same. As this 1952 CIA memo says, the aim is controlling an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will, and even against such fundamental laws of nature as self-preservation. But it was a discovery here in Basel, Switzerland, at Sandoz Laboratories by Dr. Albert Hoffman, that led the intelligence agencies of America to believe that they had found the panacea. The discovery was lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD. The film that you see is considered by many experts to be the closest illustration of the effects of a hallucinogenic. It was one of the first times that anybody had run into a powerful drug that was different than anything else that they knew anything about. 
John Gittinger, recently retired chief psychologist for the CIA. This is the first time Gittinger has been interviewed publicly. We could disable a whole city by putting a very small amount on a water supply. After all of these years of us, uh, uh, those of us who were involved in looking for this secret drug, uh, this was the only thing that began to look for the first time like it might be something like that. CIA's interest in LSD was intense. The worry was that the Russians would get hold of it. Were the Soviets into LSD? I'm going to have to say uh, I'm sure they were, but if you ask me to prove it, I, I've never seen any direct proof of it. But at one point, intelligence information received from Switzerland said that Sandoz Laboratories was about to put 100 million doses of LSD on the open market. And it caused enough concern within the agency that the United States was prepared to buy the entire supply. However, a slight mistake had been made. The mistake is made public for the first time. I just found out on a new CIA document that there were no such um, large quantities of LSD on the market. Joan Marks has filed numerous freedom of information suits against the CIA and has unearthed much new material. He is the author of The Search for the Manchurian Candidate, a history of intelligence agency work with mind control. He is a consultant for this report. What happened is that there was a military attache in Switzerland, an American officer who got milligrams and kilograms mixed up. In other words, he made a mistake of thinking one one thousandth of a gram was the same as one thousand grams, which is a mistake of a million times. So when the CIA got the intelligence that there were a hundred million doses on the market, in fact, there were a hundred doses. The man who would oversee the CIA's research into drugs and most of the agency's behavior programs is this man, Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, a chemist. Dr. Gottlieb declined ABC News' request for an interview. In their never-ending search for the miracle weapon, CIA operatives searched here in the remote mountain areas of southern Mexico for what up to then had been considered a myth, magic mushrooms. They used this man, a part-time chemist for the CIA, to dupe this man, a vice president of a bank and an amateur mycologist or mushroom expert, to try to get to the magic mushrooms and turn them into a drug. But it would be the amateur, R. Gordon Wasson and his colleagues, who would win the race and develop the drug psilocybin from the magic mushrooms. We went into the Mazatec area, far from the highways, remote from Mexico City, there we found that rotten bagasse, as it's called, bagasso, covered with mushrooms. These mushrooms I didn't know, had never, never seen. They were the sacred mushrooms. Wasson would also discover and record the ancient mystical rites of the mushrooms from a local shaman or magical priestess, Maria Sabina. And we were seeing incredible sights. And they would go slowly or they would go fast as I ordained. All your senses are rendered acute. We say that you see visions, you see hallucinations, but th that doesn't uh, begin to tell the story. The hallucinations are only part of it. You hear sounds, you smell things. The, uh, the, the night was thrilling. Word of Wasson's discovery reached the CIA quickly. Dr. James Moore, a University of Delaware chemist, secretly served the CIA preparing deadly chemicals on short notice. Moore was instructed to get close to Wasson and accompany him on another trip to Mexico to get the magic mushrooms. Internal documents show the CIA felt a drug derived from the mushrooms could remain an agency secret. What in the world were they looking for with the magic mushrooms? I think the best answer to that is that they were looking for fundamental information on compounds that were would be capable of causing changes in in behavior changes in mental attitude did you ever consider what would have happened if any of these substances were given to say unwitting people oh i don't remember having considered that specifically i what if you, I, I trust perhaps you've thought about it, uh, 
Well, I haven't worried about it. Uh, I, you, what, your question again, what would I have thought had I known that uh, the any of these substances were being would have been given to unwitting persons? Uh, you mean a a hostile agent in an, uh, of another government? No, well, I, I mean that was probably I one mean of the things they had in I mind. I mean testing it out on an American citizen. I. I guess I must seem very, very cold-blooded about this, but I don't recall ever having been very much preoccupied with that, uh, with that issue. But many drugs were tested in this way. A decision was made at the highest levels of the CIA to do testing on unwitting Americans. As one CIA document says, such testing would be operationally realistic. A former CIA official who worked on these programs describes for the first time how the decision was made. He did not wish to be filmed or recorded. Thus his remarks are read by someone else. I think every last one of us felt sorry to attempt this kind of thing. We knew we were crossing the line. Every decent kid knows he shouldn't steal, but he does it sometimes. We knew damn well we didn't want anyone else to know what we were doing. The decision was made to do testing on unwitting victims. It was decided they should be on the fringes of society because they were most vulnerable. It was the borderline underworld, prostitutes, drug addicts, and other small timers who would be powerless to seek any kind of revenge in case they found out. And as their predecessors had a decade earlier, the CIA turned to George White for help. White was now a high-ranking narcotics official. And by this time, the stories about George White were legendary. So the way this says, you know, may I help you, monsieur? And George White was busy talking with me. I paid no attention to the waiter, so the waiter tapped him on the shoulder, says, you know, may I help you, uh, monsieur? George White turned around, whipped his gun out, and stuck it in the guy's face like this in this crowded restaurant. George White did not mind bending the law, and he knew the street well. He was the ideal choice for what the CIA had in mind. We were Ivy League, white, middle class. We were naive, totally naive about this, and he felt pretty expert. He knew the whores, the pimps, the people who brought in the drugs. White set up so-called safe houses for the CIA in New York, here in Greenwich Village. And later, in San Francisco, in this hotel, and in an apartment atop Telegraph Hill, with a commanding view of San Francisco Bay. While the existence of these safe houses was disclosed last year, details of what took place within them has not been told. A former CIA official who worked in the safe houses reveals that they were used not only for drug testing, but to study sexual behavior and how it could be used to manipulate people. We did quite a study of prostitutes and their behavior. How do you take a woman who is willing to use her body to get money out of a guy to get him to talk about things which are much more important, like state secrets? We learned a lot about human nature in the bedroom. We started to pick up knowledge that could be used in operations. There would be victims in all of this, but as the agency knew, they couldn't fight back. Some entries from George White's diaries. Clarice gets horrors. Janet, sky high. As one agency memo says, we have no answer to the moral question. The safe houses were not the only testing grounds. Millions of dollars would be spent on LSD research at universities throughout the country. And word would begin to spread on campus about this so-called mind-blowing drug. And suddenly, there was the counterculture of the 60s. I give the CIA a total credit for sponsoring and initiating the entire consciousness movement, counterculture events of the 1960s. Dr. Timothy Leary, the 1960s Johnny Appleseed of LSD. The CIA funded and supported and uh, encouraged hundreds of young psychiatrists to experiment with this drug. The fallout from that was that the young psychologists began taking it themselves, discovering that it was an intelligence-enhancing, consciousness-raising experience. I know that some of the studies in which the CIA had uh, 
supported, used as subjects people who later became strong proselytizers of LSD. So in, a, in that sense, yes, I think it d did sustain the, uh, uh, the uh, p perpetuation of, of, the, of the use of the drug. And it's rather ironic, isn't it? The counter case that I would make in relationship to that is to remember that the people who were doing the research were people who would be doing the research regardless of who uh, uh, was the sponsor. I, do, I don't think anybody working in that time in the remotest ever thought that it would blow up into the kind of thing that it did. <laughs> History will judge the role of the CIA and other intelligence agencies in unwittingly contributing to the counterculture of the 60s through their intense interest in LSD and other hallucinogenics. But for the moment at least, the argument can be made that the CIA helped usher in the age of Aquarius. ABC News close-up will continue.